Chances are you've heard of the Voynich Manuscript, the mysterious book that seems to be written in an unknown language that nobody's ever been able to translate, it features drawings of plants and animals that don't exist, and nobody knows who made it. I've done a video about it here, it's super famous, but it's not the only mysterious manuscript that's ever been found. There's actually a lot of them. In fact, I got a lot of comments on that Voynich video requesting that I talk about some of them. But yeah, all around the world, we've found documents that challenge what we think we know about history, stir up controversy, and sometimes just make no sense. So today, let's take a look at some of the most mysterious ancient manuscripts that have ever been found. In my episode about the world's weirdest form of writing, I talked about how we're in a bit of a language crisis. I mean, nine languages a year stop being spoken worldwide. It's so bad that they predict that by 2080 we'll be losing a language every two weeks. And this is important because we, we lose ideas that are specific to cultures when a language dies. We lose records of time periods and people. We lose stories that were important to them at that time and could still have meaning in our lives today. And then there are the languages that we come across from our past that we can't understand that uh, even though we found them, its meaning is lost to us. But what might be even weirder is when we find manuscripts or documents in languages we do understand, where we can decipher the information in it, but that information is weird. Weird or out of place or out of time, or it's made in a way that we can't figure out by people who we don't know who they are. Now, some of these I'm about to talk about are still being studied, uh, so we may find out that they're not for real at some point in the future, but some of these have been studied thoroughly and are super legit, which only brings up more questions. So let's start our treasure hunt where else? Ancient Egypt. In 1868, an Egyptian mummy made its way to the Museum of Zagreb in Croatia. It was of an ordinary woman, nobody of any royalty or a priest or anything like that. But what was interesting was what she was wrapped in. It was linen strips with writing on it, which isn't that big a deal, but it wasn't Egyptian hieroglyphics. It actually was something unknown at the time. About 20 years later, the museum officials sent the wrappings to Vienna, and there the Austrian Egyptologist Jacob Kral looked at them, and he figured out what the language was. It was actually Etruscan. Yeah, weirdly, for some reason, this mummy had been wrapped with strips from an Etruscan linen book. This was an incredible discovery, first of all, because Etruscan was not spoken in Egypt. It was an early kind of Roman language, but also no surviving examples of Etruscan linen books had ever been found. I meant to say Etruscan, not Etruscan there. Usually a linen book like this would have dissolved away over time, but Egypt's arid climate and the materials that were used to dry the mummy helped preserve it. This wasn't just the first Etruscan linen text that was found completely intact, it was also the longest Etruscan text ever found. The book was originally a sheet about 3.4 meters long before it was torn into strips for bandages. It contained 12 columns of text written in black and red ink, and it's thought that about 60% of the original text is still on there. They also found papyrus from the Egyptian Book of the Dead wrapping the mummy's body, which could give us a clue as to who she was. So, we found this linen, it's in Etruscan, we can read it. What was this thing actually about? Well, basically it was just a calendar about which rites and sacrifices should be done throughout the year. There are certain gods mentioned, like Nethunes, who was an Etruscan water god related to the Roman god Neptune. And some of the words and names in the text lead the experts to believe that it was composed near the modern day Italian city of Perugia. Now the linen itself was dated to the 4th century BCE, but the writing is from much later. Like the word January is used as the start of a ritual year, which means that it was probably written between 200 and 150 BCE. Meaning whoever wrote this found linen that was literally like three centuries old and then wrote stuff on it, and then later it got ripped up and was used on a mummy. This linen has had quite the journey. Like to me, that's a huge mystery right there. Like who goes and finds 300 year old linen and then writes on it? This doesn't even make sense. But then there's the obvious question of how did this, you know, linen with Etruscan writing on it make its way to Egypt? So the theory is, uh, since the mummy was found in the in the city of Alexandria, which is a port city. It's a big trading hub. Um, one theory is that she was basically just wrapped in whatever material was available, which again, um, we're gonna bury this person. Let's, uh, let's, just, let's just find that book over there. Just tear up that book and just wrap, let's just do a paper mache around. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Now, if that's the case, then it would just happen to have Etruscan text on there, and there's no connection between that and the Egyptian Book of the Dead stuff that was in there. And there's not really any big mystery as to how it would have made its way to Alexandria. Like I said, it was a port city, there was a lot of trade there, and there was plenty of seafaring trade that went on in the Mediterranean way, way back when. So that's one theory, that they just found the book and wrapped her up in it because that's what was available. Another theory is that she was actually of Etruscan ancestry, so she was buried to the customs of her ancestral and adoptive cultures. But either way, it's a book that was found wrapped around a mummy, and 
If that is not worthy of a spot on a list of mysterious manuscripts, I don't know what is. Here's a thought. Instead of being a traitor, could Judas Iscariot have been Jesus' best friend? According to the controversial Gospel of Judas, that's exactly the situation. Written on papyrus and dating to around the 2nd century AD, it tells the story of Jesus asking Judas to betray him so that he can fulfill his prophecy and rise to heaven. The papyrus is actually what they call a codex that was translated from ancient Greek to the Coptic language around 300 AD. It was discovered in the 1970s in a cave near El Minya in Egypt, and it just kind of got passed along between antiquities dealers before finally winding up in a safe deposit box on Long Island, New York. It wound up in the hands of antiquities dealer Friedrich Newsberger Chakos, who bought the manuscript, tried to sell it, couldn't sell it, and then shipped it to the Mycenaeus Foundation for Ancient Art in Basel, Switzerland in 2001. There, the text was reconstructed and translated by Rudolf Kasser. Or Kasser, not sure. It was a 66-page manuscript that not only contained the Gospel of Judas, but also the first apocalypse of James, a letter from Peter to Philip, and a fragment of a text called the Book of Elogenes. Okay, so this came out hundreds of years later. It clearly wasn't the actual... Judas, who was the author of this text. It was most likely written by a Gnostic. By the way, a Gnostic is someone who believes that salvation is achieved through knowledge instead of faith. Um, they also believe that the world's creator is not perfect. So the Gospel of Judas shows Judas as being Jesus' favorite disciple, and he would actually give secret messages to Judas that he didn't tell the other disciples. Things like the creation of humans and angels and other celestial beings and the nature of the universe. The text also includes conversations between Judas and Jesus in the week before Passover. All of that's controversial, but its biggest controversy by far is the idea that Jesus actually asked Judas to betray him because he wanted, if somebody were to betray him, he would want that to be his best friend rather than an enemy. This, of course, challenges the roots of Christianity. Um, some scholars have even gone so far as to describe it as fiction or heretical forgery. It also offers up a different understanding of God, which, you know, in a perfect world would be okay. Different viewpoints and all. We don't really live in that world. So yeah, the, the, the veracity of this document is still very much under debate. Uh, obviously, it's very old, but how accurate it is has yet to be determined. Another Bible-related manuscript is the Mesekit Kelim, or the Treatise of the Vessels. It claims to reveal what happened to the Ark of the Covenant and King Solomon's treasures. I mean, don't we know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? I feel like I've seen that before. It lists items like 200,000 talents of pearls, 77 gold tablets from the walls of Eden, 1,000 lyres, and 7,000 lutes. All these items were hidden in different locations before the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. And these locations are purposefully obscure, but also kind of specific, like in a tower or in the spring of Zedekiah. Professor James Davila from St. Andrews University translated the text, but its age, authorship, and origin are still uncertain. There are also two different versions of this. The first version was put into a composite Hebrew volumes between the 17th and 20th centuries. This version says that the treasures are stashed away around Babylon between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. The other version appears on two ancient plaques, and it says that the treasures were stored in the Holy Land. Either way, Davila believes that uh, both of these are basically fiction based on different legends. As he told Life Science in 2014, quote, The writer draws on traditional methods of scriptural exegesis to deduce where the treasures might have been hidden, but I think the writer was approaching the story as a piece of entertaining fiction, not any kind of real guide for finding the lost temple treasures. There are also some similarities to the Copper Scroll, which is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls dating back more than 1900 years. For example, both texts refer to vessels and include listings of gold. So where do these documents say that the Ark of the Covenant actually is? Um, well, of course, it's mysterious. Uh, in its own obscure way, the text says that the location won't be revealed until, quote, the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So if you're watching this and your name is David and you have a child, um, please chime in in the comments. Let us know if your child is the Messiah, because uh, then we might actually find out what this thing is. In 1965, a team of looters unearthed a few items in a cave in Mexico. They found things like a wooden mask and a knife with a handle shaped like a fist. Sounds like some James Bond villain stuff. They also found a manuscript, but because they were looters, they had trouble selling it because people didn't think it was authentic. It was an 11-page manuscript on bark paper that included images of pre-Columbian death gods, a calendar for tracking Venus, and Mayan images and symbols. It eventually found its way to a book collector named Josue Sanz, I think I'm saying that right, uh, who had it displayed at the Grolier Club in New York, which is how it got its name, the Grolier Codex. Now, when I first read that, I thought, wow, that's amazing, and they, they found this at some dance club in New York. No, it's, the Grolier Club is a book club. They have exhibitions of rare books and stuff like that, so... <laughs> 
not as interesting of a story. It's not as out of place there as it sounds. But because it was found by looters and because uh, it kind of made its way to a book club where it was on exhibition and not quite, you know, in an academic sense, uh, it was still considered by many to be um, inauthentic. But in 2016, it was officially determined to be genuine. A team of anthropologists, archaeologists, and cultural experts examined the document closely. They looked at things like its content, its physical structure, and its style. They used everything from ultraviolet imaging to x-rays to microscopic analysis. They even radiocarbon dated it to the 13th century. So, it's legit. They were also able to prove that the pigments and ink in the manuscript contained no modern materials, that they were consistent with pigments that were used in three other Maya codices. In fact, the blue pigment found on one of the pages is from indigo dye and something called paligorskite. I think I'm saying that right. That's a clay mineral that Mayans use for their blue pigments. And this material was only identified in 1964 and wasn't synthesized until the 1980s. So yeah, there's no way that the looters could have made that ink back in the 60s. There are also the images in the codex that the forger in the 1960s wouldn't have known about. Like on one page, uh, there was a mountain god pictured with a cleft in the center of its head that contains maize kernels. Now that wouldn't mean anything, except that in 1974, a similar image was found on a wall painting. So the forgers would have had to known about that wall painting before faking a book with that image in it. And there's no way they could have done that. As for what's in the Grolier Codex, it's thought that it has information about Venus's role in Mayan astronomy and religion. Also, its drawings are really gnarly, and according to some places that I saw, it's considered the oldest manuscript in North America. Today, when we think of spells and incantations and stuff like that, we think of witches and the dark arts. It's kind of frowned upon. It's got some, you know, sinister motive to it. But there was a time in the ancient world when, you know, incantations and spells weren't frowned upon at all because everybody believed in magic. And that's where the Coptic Handbook of Ritual Power comes into play. It's also called the Egyptian Handbook of Ritual Power. It's just an amazing name, by the way. But it was only deciphered recently in 2014 by two Australian researchers. An antiques dealer sold it to Macquarie University in Australia in 1981. And yeah, researchers took a look at it and they figured out that it's a handbook for rituals and spells. Some of the spells include spells for love, spells for curing black jaundice, and instructions for performing an exorcism. Overall, there are 20 pages of parchment offering 27 spells and several incantations and illustrations, and at one time, it may have actually been two documents that were combined into one later on. Scholars are unsure of exactly where it was originally found, but they believe that somebody wrote it in pre-Islamic Upper Egypt around 1300 years ago. There are several references to Jesus and the Sethians in the manuscript. Uh, the Sethians were religious groups who identified with Seth, which is Adam and Eve's third son. The groups also identified with a godlike being named Bactiotha. Uh, this figure opens up the codex with these lines. I give thanks to you and I call upon you, the Bactiotha, the Great One, who is very trustworthy, the one who is Lord over the Forty and the Nine Kinds of Serpents. The translators think that the person who wrote this was not a priest necessarily, but maybe a scholar who was writing this as a way to help people achieve their goals. Like, for example, there are spells in there to help someone do better in business or to get along with other people. In a way, you could say this was like the first self-help book, but with magic. Now, before we get to the last manuscript, there are some honorable mentions we want to throw out there, some other mysterious items that are worth checking out. The colonial-era Jamestown slate was found in an old well in Jamestown, Virginia, and has overlapping scratched inscriptions and drawings of a man dressed in a ruffled collar. The Lands of the Puri Rise map is a 1513 document that shows mountains in South America that were unknown at the time, and a detailed Antarctica without ice, even though it's been covered in ice for 6,000 years. Easter Island has wood tablets that contain an undecipherable Rongo Rongo script that runs left to right and then right to left when turned upside down. And then there's the Feistos disc, which has 242 symbols that show things like an arrow, a beehive, a cat, a tree, and a tattooed head that may be phonetic groups, but since there aren't that many of them, they can't be deciphered. If any of those sound interesting enough for its own video, let me know down below. Now, last but not least, we have the Book of Soiga. And according to 16th century scholar and mystic John Dee, the Book of Soiga was actually transcribed by angels for Adam while he was in Eden. It was a medium named Edward Kelly that told him this. Uh, even though Dee was a man of science, he was also interested in the occult. So, of course, it makes sense that the Book of Soiga was part of his library. It's a 200-page book written in Latin and seems to be about Renaissance magical practices and beliefs. Uh, now, part of the book includes sections on astronomy, the identification of specific angels, summoning demons, and of course, magic. So Dee understood the Latin text, but the book's 36 pages were confusing to him, because each page contains a square of 36 rows and 36 columns of seemingly random Latin letters. That's a total of 46,656 characters. Dee couldn't decode it, and that's why he asked the medium uh, Edward Kelly for answers, and he was told that only the Archangel Michael could translate it. Or if anybody did figure out how to translate that section, they'd be cursed to die within two and a half years. So, 
you guys just stay away from it. Now the text itself does pose some, some problems. Like some of the Latin words appear written backward for no apparent reason. Uh, in fact, the word soiga may actually be the reverse of agios, which is a Greek word for sacred or holy. The book was auctioned off in 1608 after Dee died and then was just basically lost for about 400 years. But two copies were found in 1994, one in the British Library in London, another in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. But then in 2006, mathematician and cryptologist Jim Reeds figured out that code. Not to get too in the weeds about it, but each table is based on a magic word of six letters. This is the seed word, and it's different on each page. He discovered that the first 24 tables are named after constellations in the zodiac, two tables for each sign. And then there are seven tables named after planes, four after natural elements, and one after the figure of magister or master. So even with the code correct, we still don't really know what it all means. Now, one theory is that it's a representation of the universe. Oh, and remember that curse? Well, Jim Reeds is still alive, so. <laughs> but then again, he only cracked the code. He didn't figure out its meaning. So the Book of Soiga is definitely ancient and it's definitely weird. Uh, it's got a lot of mysteries around it, but uh, maybe, maybe we'll figure out its meaning as time goes on. So what do all of these mysterious codices and manuscripts have in common? Um, outside of the fact that like, we're just, look, we're humans. We, we love a good mystery. We love making sense of the world and, 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 and you know, figuring out patterns and whatnot. We're just wired that way. But something that I always wonder whenever I run across these stories about like mysterious ancient documents and stuff like that was um, how do we know they're not just people being creative? Because yes, we, we love a good mystery and we love solving mysteries and whatnot, but we're also creative people. We're artists. The very first things we did was put art on the walls of caves and stuff like that. So how do we know that this isn't just people being creative? You know, like we tend to treat everything that's written in the past like it's some kind of pure document, but most of what we write today is fiction or some kind of, you know, creative thing. So who's to say that they weren't just making up stories back then like we do today? Like I've joked before that if people from the future applied the same logic to today as we ascribe to the past, then they might find a Harry Potter book and think that we all had magical powers. So yeah, what if these manuscripts and codices were just people having fun? What if the Book of Judas was a kind of fan fiction or alternative history exercise? I like to consider that, but there's also the other side of the coin, which is that, you know, way back in, in that time, the ability to write was so rare and the process of creating documents was so labor intensive. Um, it was probably unlikely that people would have gone through all that just on a goof. But then you know, people do some crazy stuff in the, in the spirit of just being creative, so who knows? Either way, I find all of these just fascinating and I'm curious to see what else comes up. These ancient documents might not ever fully be solved, but the search is still worth doing. These documents were how we shared information back in the day. It was, it was how we learned. Today, of course, we learn most things online from news sites, social media, handsome science communicators on YouTube, and today's sponsor, Brilliant. The handsome science communicator is, of course, Scott Manley. I mean, Manley is right in his name. But about Brilliant, if you haven't tried Brilliant, you're missing out on the most intuitive brain hacking learning platform out there where you learn by solving problems and puzzles and playing games. So it kind of weaponizes your natural problem solving mechanism. So you learn it in a way that makes sense to you and you can apply it to other areas of your life. There's over 110 courses on there from basic foundational math stuff to advanced quantum physics stuff. And if you're into solving mysteries, and I'm assuming you are because you watch this video, then check it out. They've got a whole learning path for logic and deduction. You'll be thinking like Sherlock Holmes in no time. Plus they've got case studies that teach you things that you can use yourself like maximizing electric car value and how to go viral on X. And the list goes on and on. And if you sign up through my link below, you'll get 30 days to try it out for free and see what you think. If it doesn't live up, no harm, no foul. But if you do think it's got the potential to transform your thinking, you can get 20% off the annual plan. But that's only if you're one of the first 200 people to sign up using the link in today's video. So give it a look if you haven't, or if you haven't looked in a long time, uh, there's a whole lot of new stuff now. It's worth another look. So it's also a lot more interactive than it used to be. Anyway, that's brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. You can find the link down in the description. And thanks to Brilliant for being such a big supporter of the channel. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, go check out the Voynich Manuscript video, which is right here. You can go check that out. And, uh, or just go look at any of the videos that you know maybe have my face on. Click them, like them, subscribe, and you know what to do. Uh, you guys have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.